So, at work, having a meeting, and one of my colleagues is going on and on and on about a computer issue she's got. It is driving her nuts. And she's trying to describe it and go through everything she can, describing all the issues, what, working with uh, tech support, doing all this other stuff. And she says, and I'm just, I'm just, and I said, frustrated, freaked out. And she goes, thank you for giving me F words I can use in polite company. <laughs> so how about some, uh, how about we concentrate on another F word today? Forgiveness. That is a huge issue. Forgiveness, how do we even begin to define it? Several of us are taking a class that Lee and, um, and Jessica are putting on, on forgiveness, five weeks, and I get Sunday morning to talk about it. <laughs> so there are, it's much bigger, much broader, much deeper than we can ever explore in one meeting but it has such power over us. Nelson Mandela, the biggest picture of forgiveness you could ever see, 27 years in prison. He had been an apartheid activist. He definitely went down the road of nonviolence for the most part. But there were some times that there was some civil strife. There, was, there were some times that he did civil disobedience, simply because what was happening in his part of the world, where he lived, with who he was living with, was totally and completely wrong. And he was jailed for it, spent 27 years in prison. And when he was released, did he go and hunt down every person that caused that? Did he go and jail them for what the part, whatever part they had in it? No. He taught forgiveness because he recognized that if he held on to all of that resentment, it was hurting him. There's that old saying that when you don't forgive, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That doesn't work. It never has. And it's all in our own mind. It is who we are projecting on someone else. It is not necessarily the truth. We may have a completely different idea about what happened. So sometimes it's very, very good to simply have a conversation and recognize both sides of what happened. Edwin Gaines, when she was here, talks about forgiveness. It's almost like e emotional house cleaning, okay? Wipe that stuff away, brush it out, move it out, completely get it out. And we need to forgive everyone, every time, everywhere, including ourselves. We are the ones that are creating the picture in our own head. And what I absolutely know <laughs> from listening to her is that she had some things that she needed to forgive. She'll talk about that she is a woman of power. But she didn't always feel that way. Growing up, she had been abused. But she left that behind because she recognized where it was holding her. Her first husband, they were on this round-the-world trip that they had saved up for for a long, long time. And when they were in Hong Kong, he told her, I don't love you anymore. I'm leaving. And she was devastated. She carried around that anger, that resentment, 
everything that she could think of about how to hurt that person was so readily apparent. I mean, you mentioned the man's name and she flew off. And she recognized that she needed to do the work with her. That it really didn't matter what he did, it was what she was feeling. So when she was here, she gave us a practice to do. She had gone back into the Bible and read, how many times are you supposed to forgive? And the answer was 70 times 7. So how did she do it? 35 times in the morning, 35 times in the evening. I forgive you, you SOB. I forgive you. Over and over and over again, 35 times in the morning, 35 times in the evening. And then there was a slight shift. It was she could call him by name, not by her nickname. She could call him and, rec and see him without seeing red underneath it. She recognized that she was giving away her power and that that was not serving her. She recognized how perfect it was because it actually made her stronger yet again. And now she and her first husband and his new wife, they're good friends. There had always been a connection it just wasn't that way forever. And what she recognized is, yeah, I did like this guy. There, were, there are good things about him. And she said that when she got to the point where she could no longer see him in that dark, dark space, that one day she, she, sent, um, she got a letter from him. And apparently there had been some financial stuff when, when they had broken up. And he recognized it, and he sent her a check for $30,000 to make up for something that had happened in their finances. So she'll tell you, I forgive that man every week now. <laughs> because by holding on to that stuff, she was no longer in a place of letting her good in. Because when you're holding that space within your mind, what are you doing? You're leaving no space for your good to come in. Let it open. Let it go. Let it be free and get out of your way. So, it's like when we don't forgive, we're allowing somebody to live rent free in our mind. They have no rent, nothing gets in the way, and they drag us down every time. So how do we do that? How do we move on? Sometimes the hardest person to forgive is ourselves. And so it might be a good idea to start by forgiving someone else. It's like peeling that onion layer by layer when you forgive someone else for no matter what it is, you know, coming home from a meeting last week on the freeway, stop and go traffic, nothing moving over five miles an hour, and I get bumped. Okay, do I let that color my entire day, my entire week? Do I let it absolutely drag me down? I realized that we were probably only going two, three miles an hour and that there was no damage. So why get upset? Okay, somebody wasn't paying attention. But how would I want someone to treat me if I were in that same space? So I did get to the next place where I could finally get off the freeway, and that person did not follow me. They kept going, and I could have gotten upset again. But when I got home and I saw that there really was no damage, okay, that's my gift to the universe. I'm paying it forward. I am not going to get upset. I am not going to let the actions of someone else, a moment of inattention, 
destroy the rest of my day. And like I said, there, real, there was no damage, so I didn't have to worry about it. Okay. Now I get to where the rubber meets the road. My mother. <sighs> my mother was a tall woman. I'm 5'4", she's 5'8". A big woman. Force bigger than nature. And when Lee and I got engaged, we were 19. And she had loved him up until that point. <laughs> Once we got engaged, it was, this isn't right. This, you're too young. You're not finished with school. You haven't done this. You haven't done that. You, that you should not do this. Got to the point where one night we had a horrible argument. She said some things that were not kind, and I responded exactly the same way. And I recognize that I was just as big a part of it now, but I didn't see it then. I thought I was defending myself. That night was very fraught with tension. And when she left, she worked evenings. When she left for work, I called Lee, and I moved out of the house three weeks before the wedding. My parents, because we were not li I was no longer living at home, backed out of everything. My in-laws picked up everything. I didn't see my parents for five years. Um, and every time we did, after that, for probably another five years, it was very fraught with tension. It was prickly. It was uncomfortable. It was always feeling like there was judgment all around. And then finally, finding this practice, finding how to look at it differently, I recognized she was doing the best she could at the time. She had no role models that could show her anything different. And she thought she was protecting me from making the same mistake she did of marrying way too young, not finishing school, stuff like that. But I did finish school. I did, and I've been married to Lee for 43 years now. All of that, you know, when she found out he was promoted to the uh, a a vice president of marketing, she bragged about her corporate son-in-law. When she found out he was going to be a minister, that threw her over the moon. But of course, he wasn't the right kind of minister. <laughs> we, we would get brochures probably every month about being saved and taking the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. But she was doing it from a place of love. And when I finally recognized and realized that, my sister and I had gone to be with her for her 80th birthday. We met her, had a wonderful weekend, did all sorts of stuff, came back home. My s sister called me and told me, thank you. My mother had a problem with alcohol. My sister told me as we were on the way to the airport, she said, thank you for being the mom in my life when our mom couldn't. So that, I was a blubbering fool when I got on the plane. And then a month later, my mother had a massive stroke and got back down to South Carolina and was with her when she passed. There are still moments when I think of her and I recognize that she had come from a backwater type of life. She had come from very poor people but she, all she wanted was the best for me and my family. She loved my sons, and she loved what we had become. 
And I have to say, I love her too. So forgiveness doesn't change the past. You don't condone what has happened. But by forgiving, you welcome in life. And by forgiving, you create a new future, a new present, a new now. So let's pray. I want to thank you for joining us today. I am so grateful that you took your time to watch or listen to this message. If you found this message beneficial, I would ask you to go to our website. Once there, click on the Contribute button and experience the joy of conscious and purposeful giving. It is through your gifts that we are able to bring this message to the world. I would also ask you to please share this message with anyone you feel might benefit. Again, I want to thank you for joining me and the Agape community as together we bring joy to life.